Hello, delightful podcast people. Those of you viewing, if as of what's the date today? It's like sometime in January 2020, 2021, sorry. Uh, ever so slightly different setup. I'm just a bit more comfortable. Visually, it's slightly different. Audibly, you guys are probably still in with a lovely experience there. Although, again, Visually, you'll be able to see a very black, shiny, chromey, sexy, expensive looking microphone that I bought and it doesn't work with when I'm filming on my phone. Works well when I'm doing podcasts with other people on my laptop, on Skype and Zoom. But anyway, enough rubbish from me. Today's podcast topic is um, I was literally just editing a... <clears throat> check-in week presentation for MNU students and one of the questions was about well keto was the main one that was mentioned and there was another one and I think it was the other one that actually made me I can't even remember it rubbish <clears throat> maybe it was something about fasting either way I just wanted to record this, what I genuinely at this point in time believe will be quite a quick podcast. Because last night, I um, someone emailed me, don't know who this person is, uh, I, don't, I, th I feel like they're part of a company, and they said, I have a guest suggestion for your podcast i don't know if this person's a chance or who they are it didn't feel like it was one of you guys one of you my listeners it's like someone who just trawls the internet for podcast hosts and and then someone pays them to get them on their show anyway he said would you like this guest because he had her whole bio and it was like this it was like basically a cv would you like her to talk about nutrigenomics this that and the other and i was like oh interesting normally whenever anyone talks about that they are not evidence-based. But it was like she's dedicated 20 years of her life talking about this. And, and the CV was phenomenal. And I think as a researcher and as a career, she's had a fairly phenomenal career. And actually, Sarah and I were talking today about an expert that we have talking in the mentoring lab in the coming months. And... I always go through and check their presentations. Not that I'm more of an expert, but just I guess I guess with a um, questioning eye, uh, and obviously just as a second pair of eyes for people on their presentation. You know, spelling mistakes, spelling and grammar, just normal human error. And I like things done the way I like them, so uh, I often change their formatting. <laughs> with their permission and um, anyway just for consistency's sake but sometimes they might have said something and I'll just message them back and say what's your thinking behind this what's um, the evidence behind this what's what are you going to say about this because I'm just a little bit I don't understand uh, and sometimes it'll come down to the fact of like well this is kind of the general recommendation there's not a huge amount of evidence behind it. You know, this, this is often the case with... Uh, here's a little bit of info for you, off topic. We um, once, this is probably going back eight, nine years, decided we were going to pretty much rewrite the NHS website, any of the nutrition portions. And essentially, what page have they written? We'll write it. But we'd write it from a very, very strong evidence-based standpoint. Rather than what happens on the NHS Choices website, many websites like that, is they just apply a blanket recommendation of essentially the Eat Well Plate or the Food Pyramid or, or any of these kind of things. <clears throat> And so it's not really specific. The information you get isn't specific. So we would actually write it like we were talking to people. Now, some of you, I imagine, are going, why didn't you do this? You should do this. It's just such a big task. Um, writing MNU, you know, still hasn't, hasn't really stopped. We're just constantly updating, improving it, and it's the best thing in the world. 
Um, so yes, as much as I'd love to do so many of the different things that you guys ask of me and of Matt Nutrition, etc., there's only so many hours in the day. So this is what happens online in when there when there's general population nutrition guidelines. And the problem is, is generalized population nutrition guidelines do not sit on the same level or alongside as individualized nutrition because population guidelines has to take so much more into account. And my personal opinion is that less is more with population guidelines because you make specific guidelines and what happens is, is food companies and bad people profiteering people use those to then mislead people and create for instance health halos you tell everyone that they should be eating less total fat and people create unhealthy nice tasting low fat options and people believe they are good for them and you are essentially undermining people disempowering people because you've given profiteering individuals, companies, that tool to use against people. So yes, I don't like it. And some of the best countries in the world say so little with regards to their nutrition guidelines. It's amazing. We teach about some of these on MNU. Anyway, off topic. My point being, as we were going to go in and, and teach from an actual, you know, you have this issue, this ailment, you know, the evidence is you should, you know, everyone's going to do better on a healthy diet. But again, this is very often I was, I get, you'll hear me saying elsewhere on the internet, I haven't said it on the podcast, but eating the malnutrition way or eating the MNU way or eating in a healthy way based on my principles. And unfortunately, I can't just stand here and tell you all of my principles, but anyone, this is why I had that massive rant in one of my podcasts, just consume all of my content. It's all out there. It's all free. And, you know, apart from them and you, and um, you will get, you'll be so empowered in so many different situations. You'll have tools to help you with so many different situations that you might find yourself in with regards to goals you might have or um well, yeah, it's mainly the goals that you might have, but goals in certain situations, lacking motivation or whatever, or you're a client or you're, you're a lay person yourself with regards to nutrition science. But anyway, you should eat a healthy way. But are there some specific things that have shown some promise with your certain ailment that you, is worth actually digging into and using? Now... <clears throat> This is, this is what happens. So we go through um, experts' lectures and sometimes I'll say, do you, do you mind just taking that out because I don't think it's hugely helpful and it's not providing a big enough picture to help them understand why that's maybe been said. Flip over to this situation of this expert guest who seemingly is insanely knowledgeable on genetics and nutrigenetics, etc., and they had provided a link to like an hour long lecture that she had delivered and uh, very, very academic. And all of it was just like, yeah, this is all legit. This is just unquestionable, unequivocal information. She's the problem is, is I then got towards the end and she was drawing on information from different research groups and this, that and the other. And I, you know, heard the word keto and it sparked my interest. And the problem is this. And what I want to get across to you. And so, yes, content is only going to start at how many minutes into the podcast? But it's going to end quick, right? It's going to start late and end quick. Exactly what you probably don't want. <laughs> the huge problem out there with this woman is very 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 academically qualified likely a high iq individual another thing that she did actually regularly was was talk about all of these petri dish studies and animal studies which without without a great deal of what's the word 
pessimism, no, that's not a good word, skepticism around the, their applicability. So you do, you do a study in an, in an animal or you do a study in a Petri dish, not in a real human. So we call in vitro, in test tube studies, essentially. And talking about all these effects of these things happening in the, in the Petri dish, in the lab. But, kind, you know, talking about them with so much vigor and so much like, this is like, wow, blah, blah, blah. Alarm bells, massive alarm bells. But then she started talking about in vivo studies. And in vivo studies are the ones that we are looking at the whole um, organism, the human in this case. Now, in vivo studies, you can there's still sometimes not a cause and effect ability to look at this. But what people have done, for instance, in Alzheimer's uh, and many, many other situations, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, I'm now trying to think of some of these other situations, obviously weight loss. And what so many, I'm, I'm picking on this, on this woman, not naming her, not trying to shame this individual, because this is a habit that I see time and time and time again. And you know who I see this a lot in is doctors. Doctors who become nutrition experts overnight. They've never studied nutrition, but they maybe have a, uh, what I call, nutritionally religious experience. So they have this personal enlightening moment with nutrition that they just lose all, um, you know, chop the top of their head off, pull their brain out, put their head back on. Oh yes, we should all do keto. Um, is essentially what comes out of so many of these doctors' mouths. You know, uh, Professor Tim Noakes, he's prime example. If you've never heard my debate with Tim Noakes, uh, where he said that eating over 35% of your calories of, from protein would lead to death. That was a funny one, wasn't it? For any of you long-time listeners, go find that Sigma Nutrition Radio podcast, Martin McDonald versus Tim Professor Tim Noakes. Uh, it would, that was a very, very strange podcast to do. You know, this guy's a world-renowned, A-rated professor and he has just turned into a complete and utter quack. And, you know, I mean, he's South African, and I don't know if that's racist or not, but it's something that I think, oh, what's it called? I mean, it probably is racist in this day and age. What isn't racist in this day and age? Um, but I'm, it's a stereotype, isn't it? Lots of South African men, lots of the South African men I know are very manly and shouty and... Um, a bit too aggressive and not like violent but just they're like blue you know they're, they're flipping a punch in the face whatever i mean he's tim notes is an old man but he just literally sh kept interrupting me and just kept shouting whenever i essentially proved him wrong uh you know i was talking about study after study and all he kept talking about was unpublished data in his opinion and nothing i said can be disputed because i was just talking about data and also because I have so much respect for Danny, I was just trying to be polite, uh, which in hindsight, loads of people are like, the fantastic, this, that, and the other. But there's also that part of every human, the e your ego part of your brain and stuff. And I was just like, I just wish I'd said to him, just shut the hell up and listen and let me teach you, you gimp. Uh, I wish I'd said that just, you know, just for one point, you know, just one time when he just, you know, when someone interrupts you a million times. Shut your mouth, please. Because he was insanely rude. Anyway, where was I? So Tim notes is this obvious example. You've got someone like Asim Malhotra, who's a cardiologist, who's on UK TV so, so much, who is a very, very media-friendly uh, cardiologist doctor, speaks very, very well, and knows when to rein it in. So if you know him, you know how unevidence based he is, non evidence based he is, how he's very, very, very anti carbohydrate and just doesn't make evidence based recommendations. Although, when he needs to and when he's in certain audiences, he dials it back and he almost sounds reasonable how he should eat a whole unprocessed food diet in general. 
He talks about eating real food. But when you speak to him, to him, potato is not real food uh, because it's a high, carbo- high carbohydrate, high glycemic index food. Even though some of the healthiest populations on the planet time and time again eat lots of potato. Anyway, this thing that they do, they have these religious experiences with their nutrition or maybe a patient's nutrition. And what I'm talking about is the unintended consequences of a nutritional recommendation. And actually, I think that's probably what this podcast is going to be called. The unintended consequences of a nutritional recommendation. And we can see this through the ages, through population-based recommendations. We can see it through, I remember one of my professors once making a ju- telling us about when he was a practitioner, practitioner, this is Professor Ron Morn, he made a joke and went, this was back in, I guess, the 80s, where fat loading was a thing and they were wondering if they could improve endurance performance through fat loading. And he said something like, well, yeah, you could just drink a cup of, of cream beforehand. And he actually had an athlete do that because they either thought he was serious or they were like, well, I'm going to try it because, you know, elite athletes are just a bit mad sometimes, aren't they? So his unintended con- consequence of like a, a bit of a joke was that. Now, what I'm talking about, I'll give you a really simple example, is the ketogenic diet. The unintended consequence often of a very, very brushstroke recommendation to go keto whatever that means you know so many people are like i'm keto and it's like you're not mate your carbohydrates are way too high for you to be in keto or um you know even we know now some interesting stuff about protein not taking people out of ketosis unless it would potentially be obscenely high supported by like the upper end of the ketogenic level of carbohydrate or whatever But sometimes individuals say they're keto. It's a bit like gluten-free and you get the, people go to be like, what's gluten? They're like, oh, it's a, it's a carbohydrate. Or, you know, people just don't get what they're doing, but they've changed their diet so much. So an unintended consequence, which may be not be a negative one, but an unintended consequence of it may be that they just eat less junk. And these are all these different things, you know, unintended consequen- consequence of maybe saying you must eat breakfast is someone eats more calories and gains weight. And uh, th- they, there's a study where they did that. And um, regular breakfast skippers, they got them, they said, you must eat breakfast. They told them to start eating breakfast and they gained weight. But yet you have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of dietitians, nutritionists, personal trainers that will tell you, I get my clients to eat breakfast and they lose weight. The unintended consequences here are not necessarily due to the advice, eat breakfast. But that person eats breakfast, they get a small win for the day, and therefore their normal mid-morning sausage roll, croissant, and hot chocolate, you know, 1,000 calories, they don't have because they feel good about whatever they had. Now, Now, an often cited unintended consequence of going keto is an increased protein intake. So some of the early studies where we looked at keto and the results it was uh, that were coming about from it showed a significantly different protein intake. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. Is, is keto, if you stick to the laws, let's say, of the 85%-ish calories from fat, 10%-ish calories from car, uh, protein, 5%-ish calories from carbohydrate. Those kind of laws. <laughs> um, the, this is why there's some definitions are difficult because a ketogenic diet really is anything that puts you into ketosis. But we know there are very different scenarios. Like you can have endurance athletes becoming ketotic going into ketosis but consuming quite a lot of carbohydrate simply because their energy expenditure is so high but if we stick to these rough guidelines of like less than 25 grams of carbs a day or that that macronutrient ratio that i just mentioned there we then can compare that to you know 
a different dietary habit like a government guideline less than 35 percent calories from fat which amazingly if some of you didn't know is termed a low fat diet even though that's not low fat in my opinion um and then protein and carbohydrates set where they're set. So there's that option, or there's this scenario where you go to a doctor or a dietitian or whoever, and say, they say, go keto, and you start changing your diet and changing the foods you eat, but actually you just eat boatload, uh, a lot more protein, you do eat more fat, less carbohydrate. And if we're talking about, um, there's something called intention to treat for some of you who are geeks out there. My intention with my advice is to improve someone's diet or their health or a metabolic marker or etc. And I'm going to give them this advice. Whether they follow it or not or whether they actually do it, you know, eat a ketogenic diet of this percentages. Even if they go away and they don't actually eat that because my advice led as an unintended consequ consequence for them to do that. My intention was that and let's see the outcome versus let's put people in a metabolic ward and control everything. Um, I was going to say everything that goes into them. I wonder what they do do about that. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> lol. Uh, control everything that goes into their mouths. Again, another one. Everything they eat, food, drink, etc. There you go. It's a better way of putting it. In that instance, we can see what's the actual difference. Um, so we can actually see what the uh, experimental effect of those very specific stark con starkly contrasting macronutrient ratios will have, for instance. Now, hopefully this is just, again, what you're going to get out of this. Well, you'll hopefully, some of you, lay the lay person, listener, the lay listener, you'll get some idea of this is why when I did keto, our X, Y, Z happened. It wasn't necessarily anything magic. And I'm as I move forward with this discussion, hopefully that's what you're going to get more of. If you're a practitioner, you'll be able to have these discussions with clients or other practitioners um, or, or do social media content and posts about this. You'll be able to understand some of the zealot-like headlines. And the thing I wanted to talk about when I mentioned dementia earlier and, and all these different things is very often <clears throat> you get this scenario where people don't understand nutrition very well. They're not a practitioner. So this is the example of this researcher I'm talking about or any researchers sometimes. And what happens is, is they go, right, Blood glucose is too high. This person has blood glucose dysregulation. We want to bring their blood glucose down. We want to help them regulate their blood glucose better. Now, if they jump straight to, right, we're going to take a group of individuals, a group of patients, and we're going to put them on keto. Oh, my goodness. <gasps> We've lowered their blood glucose, or we have led to a more stable blood glucose profile, etc., etc. Quick, do a press release, do a new study, do whatever. But the problem is, is you can't say that that was because of keto specifically because you have taken them from their normal environment and changed a bunch of stuff. What you can do is, is if we didn't know anything else that worked, oh my goodness, we've got a first insight to something that works. Quick, get on it. Now, that would have been acceptable 50 years ago, roughly. But since 50 years ago, we've known plenty else. And it's this example of all these zealots everywhere on the internet and in real life <laughs> who go, my way is the best who you get a carnivore person and a vegan and a keto and a paleo and a whoevero gimpo on your post alkaline gimp on your if in your facebook group in your instagram post comments saying that their way is the best and they did xyz and they got these results um so how can it be all of them 
The reason is, is people significantly changing their dietary habits and doing the things. It's if you did a Venn diagram, it's where these things all meet. What do none of them really have a great deal in if they are a healthy version of those different things, as healthy as each one can be? Some of them are inherently less healthy because of the amount of restriction within them. But they generally become a more wholesome, whole food diet. The person pays more attention, they may be more consistent with their eating, and maybe they start doing some exercise with it. Who knows? It isn't a prerequisite, but obviously if they do any of these things. Now, my problem is, is like this nutrigenomics individual. Oh, this team of researchers used keto in these individuals and X, Y, Z happened. Beta amyloid plaque formation decreased. I actually just remembered I did uh, a huge essay on neurodegenerative disorders for my clinical nutrition postgrad. And that's where that amyloid plaque thing came from in my head. Um, you don't need to understand that. I don't even really understand that. Um, but the problem is, is the same as I just said with dementia. It, it, any of these things, that diabetes, weight loss, et cetera, et cetera, or, or scrap weight loss for a minute, because what I'm saying is you put someone on keto and they uh, feel less hungry or they just eat less calories because you've cut most of the foods they are mostly off used to eating. Put someone on keto for a year and what happens? We see the studies. We know what happens. There's some weight regain. People get used, People are more able to eat those calories uh, that, because they find better ways. They realize that you can put bacon and butter with everything. They, they do fat bombs. This, this is one of the most stupid things on the internet, fat bombs. We need, you need to get yourself into a better fat burning mode. So we're going to put butter in your coffee and add a boatload of calories to your diet. Ridiculous. If you enjoy it and you like the taste, knock yourself out. My point being, it is not enhancing any kind of fat loss method. So, sorry, I just need to check the time. I've got check-in week soon with the students. Yep, 20 minutes. Uh, so this is the problem so often. If you, this is why in studies we have comparison groups. You have a control group or a comparison group. You've heard of things, some of you will have heard of like placebos. These things are important in different scenarios. There's lots of um, reasons that research is done the way it is so that we can provide adequate answers to a research question. The problem is, is you get people like this taking absolute, schoolboy village research studies and I'm not insulting the people who did the study I'm taking the, I'm uh, I'm, in, I'm insulting if that's the word you want to use I'm correcting I'm I'm telling them that they're silly the people that jump from that very first stage type of research in vivo research and jumping to that being something that's recommended what's recommended is any nutritional paradigm that you want to create that is known to improve, for instance, blood glucose. So in so many instances, so many diseases, we see blood glucose dysregulation. And then there's this, this instant thing of like, we'll eat less carbs. But we know you don't need to do this. And this is why Tim Noakes became so irate. Because I started mentioning these other studies where they don't lower carbohydrate intake. They change carbohydrate intake. Other studies where they change the distribution of carbohydrate intake. And yet, and even actually some of um, Professor Kevin Hall's studies where they <laughs> kept, we know, you know, 99 times out of 100, weight loss, fat loss, a calorie deficit, an energy deficit will lead to these improvements. And so you can do that any which way. But an easy brush stroke is just cut out all the carbohydrates that you like eating. But you could do, you know, go vegan, uh, cut out all these nice foods that you like eating. Anything, fruitarian, just pick a, you know, I have the C diet, you can't eat anything with being in with C. What do you mean? Just anything, anything beginning with C. Carrots? No. Crisps? No. Cakes? No. Cookies? No. Carbohydrates? Oh, hell no. Um, 
chicken? No. I mean, it's sad that that had to go, but sorry, it begins with C. You can have some duck. You could eat a male chicken. <laughs> I wish Tim Noakes would eat a male chicken. <laughs> Ouch! Ooh, burn! Anyway, hopefully some of you laughed at that. Some of you are offended. No, none of my listeners would be offended by that. That was a quality joke. Um, any ladies or men who want to eat male chickens, that I'll probably let that slide on the C diet. Um, where was I? Cookies, McDonald's, it, the C, it's there. It's so, you can't have that. Uh, carbonara, nope, out. Anyway, you see my point. You just cut out enough foods and people get into an energy deficit for a period until they realize that they can still eat loads of foods beginning with B, bacon, butter, b- beans, bovril. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this. You get my point. You can get a lot of calories from some of those things I just mentioned. Bolognese. Hello. And all the other letters, actually. We were only cutting out C's, remember? So you've got all the letters in there. You can have some zebra, some xylophones, all the all the, uh, usuals. Yachts. Feast away. So... Unintended consequences, people going keto because it's a blanket statement, it changes it. People don't jump to veganism, or they didn't. You know, people are jumping that way more as a, and as a way, and people will lose weight. And if they don't have a control group, <clears throat> but even if they do have a control group, this is the issue. Keep your eating exactly the same. Thank you. Do this weird, wacky, wonderful diet. Oh, look, because we changed things up so much, you ate less because you weren't sure how to cook or, you know, etc., etc. Or the quality of your diet improved. This is something that is often isn't mentioned. You know, they just, you're eating a load of chocolate and then, and crisps and ice cream. Did I mention chocolate on the sea diet? <sighs> nope, that's out. But someone just is taken into a lab and they change their eating a little bit. The point being, if you don't compare keto versus, like Kevin Hall does, Professor Kevin Hall, these are some of the best studies that literally have destroyed the insulin hypothesis for anyone who has half a brain or even a bit less. Because these studies were so well controlled. I think it's Hall 2015 or 2016. Uh, ultra, ultra low carb versus low fat diets, same calories. And keto isn't magic. End of story. Uh, the 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 results were just. I mean, the zealots still argue as they would, as you would imagine a religious nut would. But for, it's plain for us all to see that insulin was mega high in the uh, super low fat, super high carbohydrate. Um, Not not like they weren't just eating beans and pulses and lentils, etc. It was like just typical carbohydrates, super high in a deficit. And obviously, super high insulin and fat loss occurred because there was an energy deficit. So there you go. I don't know how long I've gone on. It was supposed to be relatively short. I hope this kind of bite-sized level of information just, just makes you go, aha, wow, I've understood something. I'm, maybe it's connected a dot somewhere, a conversation you've had with a, a keto-type zealot uh, or, or whoever, any zealot. In these comparisons, you have to have them. And and it's an encouragement for any of you practitioners or researchers or anyone who, who follows my work to stop doing that. Stop. Stop going, this was magic and this therefore helped in the the situation of um, whatever. Any of these diseases where blood glucose management or or we know that an energy deficit is just going to lead to the same thing. We do need to have discussions of what's the best thing as a blanket, you know, on a population level uh, or on a broad brushstroke, you know, uh, local level. If it's your uh, parish is a word that's coming into my head. But like, um, what's the thing? P in the UK, we have these. You have these things. It's like you're all right. You're all shouting at me now. I don't care. But anyway, 
your surgery, your group of patients, your gym, you know, if, if you can't work one-on-one, -on -one, individualize people's nutrition, what is what are good broad brushstrokes? I know what mine would be in general, and I talk about them, and, and you know, I've gone on. You have to keep listening to my stuff to find out what they are, but they're, not, they're nothing sexy. This is the problem. It's what we all deep down know roughly how we should eat. And then there'll be individual differences for us based on preferences and maybe genetics and that kind of stuff that we can't currently test very well, but maybe one day. But, but we need to have these discussions of like, yeah, if you do just go to people, eat, eat as based on the eat well plate, and then you go eat keto. What, who's going to get better results? Who knows? Or, you know, and then you have to, what's the results of what? And, and then you've got long-term adherence versus just what's going to be better in the first 12 weeks of telling people to do that, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a huge fan of the government guidelines as they are taught maybe or as they are, how they are blanketed, you know, putting meat and cheese in with, I was asked this recently by a journalist, meat and cheese in with ice cream and, can't remember the other one, but it's just the bait that's on the NHS Choices website or something. It's just silly lumping stuff in there, you know. Saturated fat equals ice cream. I think it's ice cream crisps maybe or cookies and then meat and cheese. Like such distinctly different foods just lumped in into that section. It's, it's, ah, it's moronic, quite frankly. And it's a real shame that anyone's allowed that to happen like that. Um, cool. Unintended consequ consequences of nutritional recommendations. There you go. There you have it. Thank you so much for those of you who have uh, been reviewing the podcast. It's amazing to read those well well over the 200s, into the 200s now. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions on this podcast, go to my Instagram or Facebook where I do the post about it. They're super easily signposted. If you've got a question or you enjoyed it, please let me know there. Share this around. This podcast would be a great one to be shared around. Lots of, uh, you know... In publicly, but obviously in private, in, if you get into a debate with anyone who's misinformed or is misinforming others. Uh, until ne next time, much love.